Okay, welcome everyone and thank you for signing up to today's class. With me is Dana Dean from Legal Aid Society of San Diego. I'm gonna be doing a little bit of housekeeping before we get started um, and continue to give everyone a chance to log on. My name is Nicole Gelati and I'm from the San Diego Law Library. I just wanted to tell you guys a couple things about the presentation today. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of the Zoom session. Um, and I will feed your questions to our speaker if we have time at the end of today's class. Um, I just wanna let everyone know that today's class is not a CLE pre presentation. So this will not be for CLE uh, credit. Um, additionally, the session is not for individualized legal advice, uh, so please keep your questions general rather than asking personal situation-based types of questions. And lastly, you will see a survey link at the end of today's program. We'd be very appreciative if anyone took the time to fill out that quick survey and give us some feedback on the program. Um, so I'll thank you guys in advance for that. And now I will turn things over to our speaker, Dana Dean. Thank you so much, Nicole. Hi, everybody. Uh, Dana Dean here with Legal Aid Society of San Diego. I am uh, a senior attorney on the SSI advocacy team at Legal Aid. In particular, I do a lot of work. I do work with some uh, adult SSI applicants as well. However, the focus of today's presentation is going to be on our children's program, uh, which I handle. Uh, a lot of people aren't very familiar, familiar with the fact that children can get SSI benefits as well if they have special needs. And I'm here to talk about um, the eligibility requirements for children to get SSI benefits. I'll kind of explain, you know, what SSI is about um, and how legal aid can help people through the process of applying for SSI for their children and um, how you can qualify for our services uh, to, you know, if you uh, need assistance for, for a child that you know that has special needs. So thanks again for having me and let's get started. So a little bit of background on legal aid. We are a nonprofit legal services organization, a nonprofit law firm um, that helps people in particular who are low income. Low income, it has a definition. Um, typically, we don't uh, take people that are that earn more than 125% above the federal poverty level. That said, uh, there are each legal team at Legal Aid um, that is separated by area of law might have funding from other entities as well that has different uh, income or, or different eligibility requirements. So it can kind of, whether you're eligible for our assistance or not can depend on what your legal issue is. With SSI in particular, we do have a little more wiggle room when it comes to income and asset requirements. Um, so as long as your family fits the income and asset requirements for SSI, we um, will oftentimes still be able to accept you as a client, even if maybe you're a little over, um, you, you know, if you're over 125% of the poverty level, um, it just kind of depends on um, your particular situation. Um, and so legal aid in its current form has been around since 1953. However, we were, before 1953, we were uh, known as the Office of the Public Attorney, and we were, so we have actually been around in some form or another actually since uh, 1920. We celebrated our centennial right when COVID started in 2020. So we've actually been around for about 100 years, and our goal is to, you know, provide access to justice for people who normally wouldn't be able to afford a private attorney, and you um, have to be a San Diego County resident in order to uh, qualify for our services. So we are divided into a bunch of legal teams. We have about 11 different teams that handle various legal issues. So in addition to SSI, we have several housing teams that deal with evictions, um, uh, uh, discrimination in housing, Section 8, uh, tenants rights in particular. Uh, we have a family law team that deals with uh, child custody issues and divorce uh, when they're when it involves child custody issues. 
bankruptcy, consumer protection, tax, unemployment benefits. Uh, we do other public benefit help with other public benefits such as CalWORKs, CalFresh. Uh, we have a consumer center for health education and advocacy that that is one of our big, big teams that deals with anything insurance related. If you're having trouble navigating Medi-Cal or the, the covered California exchange, if you are getting denied, you know, uh, a prescription, we can, you know, try to help appeal that. If you have grievances against a medical provider, we can, you know, hear your grievance. Um, so we do, we do a lot of different things. What basically what we don't do is we don't do any criminal law. We don't do civil litigation, like people suing other individuals, um, like personal injury cases, for instance, we, and we don't do estate planning, but we do a whole lot of other stuff. We also have free walk-in legal clinics, self-help legal clinics uh, at the various courthouses around the county. So for instance, we have a domestic violence restraining order clinic and a civil harassment order clinic. We have a gender and name change clinic as well, if you want to officially change your gender or your name. Um, so yeah, and that uh, the information on our clinics uh, is all available on our website. So as far as SSI, that stands for Supplemental Security Income. This is a public uh, federal government benefit, uh, particularly for people who are low income. And we have a, a team that helps adults that need to apply for SSI and children. We are the only uh, organization in the county that has a program specifically dedicated to children uh, getting SSI, at, the, at least that I know of. So um, I think these numbers are fairly current. They have probably gone up in the last few months, but generally, you know, for the most part, we've provided legal services to over 800 families uh, needing SSI. We've secured SSI benefits for a little over half of those families and have obtained uh, SSI awards totaling uh, almost $2 million in SSI benefits. So we've made it made a big impact in some families lives for sure, uh, who needed that extra help to pay for disability related expenses for their children. So, um, well, as I just said, SSI helps provide for the basic needs of, of children who have a mental or physical disability, it can be either one. These are the SSI benefit rates in California for 2023. Now I say in California because some states, there is a federal benefit like base benefit that you get. And then some states add a supplement to that federal benefit. California is one of those states. Not every state does. Um, and the states that do, the amount of their supplement varies. So in California, they add about an extra 200 bucks a month to the federal benefit. So for minors, uh, that benefit comes out to about a little over $1,000 a month. For adults, it's a little over 1100 So eligibility requirements for a child, it's broken up into these categories. So a, a child can qualify for disability benefits from the day that they're born, if they're born with some sort of congenital you know, disorder. Um, and they qualify for child benefits up until they turn 18, at which point, of course, they have to apply as an adult. And it's different disability standards that they're looking at between children and adults. So there are income and asset limits for uh, SSI. And with children, they are looking at the income of the parents. And um, the income limits vary and there's a whole chart that I'm going to show you on the next slide um, that takes various factors into account and then comes up with the the income limit based on the various factors uh, and I'll show you that on the next slide as far as resources and resources is just another term for assets the limit for um, the limit of liquid assets that a one parent household can have is about four thousand dollars and for a two parent household it's about five thousand dollars it's not a lot of assets. Um, those asset caps were set a very like decades ago and they have not changed. There is uh, some, there is a bill in Congress that is trying to uh, raise the asset cap for SSI to you know account for inflation and whatnot, um, but that has not passed yet. So the asset limits are still pretty low. There are certain exceptions. Uh, let me see if I talk about those. In, no, I don't think so. There are certain exceptions to the asset limits. So 
if you, for instance, if you happen to own the home that you live in, they do not count your home as an asset if you live in it. If you have a vacation home, for like a second home or a, a home that you use as rental property, for instance, they will absolutely count that uh, as an asset and you likely will not qualify. Uh, similarly, if you have, they, they will exempt one vehicle from the asset limit uh, if, if you use that vehicle for transportation. However, a lot of families have more than one vehicle. And so if you have more than one vehicle then the second, third vehicle, everything beyond the first vehicle, they are going to count um, at, against the asset limit, this four or $5,000 asset limit. Uh, oftentimes we have the question of, well, I finance my car or I lease my car. Does that, is that going to count as an asset? So let's say you have two cars. One is exempted. The second car is leased. If it's leased, you don't own it. So they're not going to count that. Uh, if it's financed, you might own a little portion of that car, but not the whole thing. The bank still owns most of it. So then they're going to look at, you know, how much of the second car have you paid off? And they're going to, you know, then figure out the value, your ownership value of that financed car um, to figure out and, and apply that against the asset limit. There are also uh, citizenship requirements that the child must meet. The child uh, does not have to be a U.S. citizen. Uh, they can be a permanent resident. They can be an asylee. They can be a refugee. However, if the child is not a U.S. citizen, there are sort of uh, additional hoops uh, that you have to jump through or additional requirements that must be met in order for you to qualify for benefits. For instance, uh, a child who's a permanent resident, their parent has to have a certain amount of work history in the country for um, the permanent resident child to qualify. Um, and, you know, there are, there are other requirements of the child as a refugee or asylee. Uh, a lot of times people ask me, well, what if the child is a citizen, but the parent isn't? Um, Technically speaking, that shouldn't matter. They're only looking at the citizenship status of the child. However, where it can become a sticky issue uh, and where we have to have, you know, kind of a long conversation with the parent is if the child is a U.S. citizen, let's say because they were born here in the United States, however, their parent might be undocumented and doesn't have a social security number, then that becomes an issue. Um, not because the child doesn't qualify. The child could still technically qualify for benefits because they're a citizen. However, when you're applying for SSI for a child, you have to disclose the social security numbers of everyone that is living in the child's household. So if the parent or another household member doesn't have a social security number, um, that might you know, we can't not put the person on there because we have to answer all the questions. We have to put everybody that's in the household. Um, but if you don't put a social security number on there, that could potentially raise a flag to social security that there might be, you know, somebody that doesn't have legal status um, in the household. And then we might have to have a conversation with the parent that says, look, social security is a federal agency. They share information with other, other federal agencies, including ICE, including the Department of Homeland Security. They have records of, you know, like uh, of any time anyone has ever crossed the border, Social Security has access to that information. So even though in reality, we haven't seen any adverse consequences from an undocumented parent applying for SSI for their child, we have heard of uh, one or two stories where a, a parent may have been talking to a social security employee and that employee was not very nice and was questioning them about their legal status. And I've heard once, you know, at least one or two stories where um, they've threatened to call somebody, another agency on the parent. That is ex exceedingly rare. And like I said, we haven't actually seen any adverse consequences from that, but in that situation, we do have to have a very serious conversation with the parent as to whether they want to take that risk by applying for the benefits for their child. Um, as far as residency, the child and parents must reside within San Diego County for us to be able to help you. Um, and 
for SSI, you must be residing in the United States. This again can become an issue if the family, is, you know, we live in a border town. So if the family is crossing the border a lot and staying in Tijuana, let's say for extended periods of time, that will affect the child's SSI eligibility. You cannot receive benefits if you are out of the country for 30 consecutive days or more, um, at least until you come back to the country for another 30 days or more. Um, and again, people that are uh, on benefits will be surprised sometimes when they've spent time in Tijuana, let's say, uh, or anywhere in, in Mexico or any other country, and then their benefits get cut off and they're like, how did they even know? Again, like I said, Social Security has access to other federal agencies information that shows every time you've crossed the border. Um, so yeah. And as far as the actual disability uh, requirements, you have to be in some sort of treatment or getting some sort of services for your child in order to successfully qualify uh, for disability. So um, it, you can't just say that, oh, I think my child has ADHD. It has to be documented somewhere, either in their medical records or in their education records oftentimes. This is that income chart I was telling you guys about. Um, and it is based on whether the income in the household is earned or unearned. Earned meaning are the earnings from a job that the parent has or the earnings from uh, unearned, like say from other public benefits that the, the parent has, like maybe CalWORKs or um, you know maybe the parent gets disability benefits, that would count as unearned income. It also depends on how many other children are in the household. Um, that aren't applying for SSI. Uh, so based on, you know, so let's say you have two children, one is applying for SSI because they have a disability, the other child is uh, not eligible because they have no disabilities. So that would be one ineligible child. Um, and let's say it's a one person household and that person, um, you know, has a job, all their earnings are from a job, then the income limit for, for that situation would be this 39. Uh, oh, excuse me. This says 2022. Um, it should say 2023. It's gone up a little bit since then. I apologize for that. Um, but it, it goes up a little bit every year. But just know that it is somewhere around this number. Um, it goes up a little bit every year, like a few dollars every year. So examples of qualifying disabilities. Uh, this is certainly not an exhaustive list. However, this is what we see pretty often, and especially the top two. Probably the most common disability that we see with our child clients is autism, followed by ADHD. And then oftentimes, you know, there's some sort of anger issues like oppositional defiant disorder, things like that. Uh, again, this is not an exhaustive list, but the, these are um, the most common examples. So these are the stages of applying for SSI. You know, there's an initial application that you fill out. And um, just FYI, legal aid helps with all stages of the application process, all these stages that you see here. Not necessarily with every single case, like we will not appeal every case of ours to federal district court, for instance, um, you know, if we don't think that Social Security, you know, made an egregious error in denying somebody or anything like that. We only take kind of um, the strongest, you know, kind of the more slam dunk cases, so to speak, to court. Um, but theoretically, we could assist you with any of these levels. So initial application. If your initial application is denied, you have the right to ask that Social Security reconsider that first decision, which just means that the another person will review the Social Security file and make a decision. You see the least amount of success at that reconsider reconsideration level because most times the second person deciding the case just adopts the first person to, person's decision because they don't want to step on anybody's toes. We see probably the most amount of success at the next stage, which is a hearing in front of an administrative law judge. That, uh, and we have attorneys on our team that attend these hearings with people to you know, argue the case and provide that support there for the clients. Um, and if you get denied at that level, you then appeal to a higher body and an internal social security body that reviews judges' decisions for errors. And if you lose at that level, then um, we will look at whether we will sue Social Security for you in federal court. And we have we do have plenty of those cases. We have an excellent track record. We win almost all of our federal cases. Um, 
I can't, of course, promise any sort of outcome. Uh, that would be unethical for me to do so, but it is true that we have a very good track record in federal court. We have even gone beyond the lower levels of federal court. We have taken a case. Um, this doesn't happen very often, but we have taken a case to the Ninth Circuit before and won there. And when I say win, I should clarify that doesn't necessarily mean when you when you sort of win your appeal, that doesn't necessarily mean you're getting granted benefits, unfortunately. It is exceedingly rare for the appeals council or a federal judge to actually grant a person benefits. When we say we won the appeal, usually the best we're getting out of that scenario is that the judge's decision is just dismissed. It's just thrown out and you get the opportunity for another hearing. So that's usually what that means, which is a good outcome because you get another bite at the apple, essentially. And sometimes that means that, you know, when the judge knows, oftentimes it goes back to the same judge for the second hearing. Uh, and sometimes the fact that their first decision got thrown out, me, you know, makes it easier for them to grant the second time around. Sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes judges will just um, learn how to write their denials better the next time around, <laughs> but, uh, in any event, um, so how does social security figure out whether a child is disabled or not? How are, what standards are they using? So this is the three-step evaluation that they use for children is, is the child working? Uh, does the child have a severe impairment and does the child meet equal or functionally equal a listing and I will go into all of those in more detail. So you do not go through all three steps in every single case. For instance, if the the answer to step one is is the child working and the answer is yes and they're earning over a certain amount of money. Uh, they're going to be denied right there they're not going to go on to step two and three so the, they have to follow in sequence. So first question, is the child working? If yes, now now oftentimes children aren't working, but uh, teenagers, for instance, might, you know, hold down a part-time job at a grocery store, let's say, or, or whatever the case may be. So you'll see that question come up more often in, you know, teenage cases. If yes, they're asking how much. The, the gross earning cap for someone to still be able to qualify for SSI um, benefits is 1470 a month uh, in 2023. This has this amount goes up every year with the cost of living increases uh, by a little bit, uh, usually no more than a hundred bucks a year. So this number will go up again in 2024. I think last year it was, uh, 1350 or something like that. I already forgot. But in 2023, if a child is earning gross earnings more than 1470 a month, they'll be denied. Otherwise, you go on to step two. Does the child have a severe medically determinable impairment, which has a specific definition, of course. Now, when we say does the does the child have a severe impairment, the term severe is a little bit misleading here because really it's it's not a very high bar to get past this step. They're not looking at whether the the impairment is actually totally disabling at this point. What they're asking is, does this impairment cause more than a slight abnormality in the child's functioning um, that results in more than minimal functional limitations? So this step is really just to weed out claims that really have no grounds. Um, and so it's it's really not hard to to meet the bar at this step. So. The hardest part is step three. Does the child's condition meet the, the Secretary of Social Security's listing of medical impairments? So these listings are actual, a whole list of physical and mental conditions that are posted on Social Security's website. They're broken down and organized by different body systems. So, so there's the, the physical listings might be broken down into, you know, cardiovascular disorders or pulmonary like lung disorders, blood disorders, you know, neurological disorders, things like that. And then there's a whole separate section for mental health disorders like autism, ADHD, depression, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so, so each of those listings will break down the diagnostic criteria for each of those disorders and 
So, you know, for instance, with depression, they're going to want to see, you know, lack of appetite. They're going to want to see, um, you know, uh, trouble sleeping. It's evidence in the records of trouble sleeping. They're going to want to see, you know, evidence of, um, you know, suicidal thoughts might come into play, you know, not a very pleasant thing to talk about, but it is, you know, relevant to how severe it is, things like that. So it'll spell out exactly what they want to see. Um, and then uh, it also includes, in addition, their functioning needs to be at a marked or extreme level of impairment, meaning it's got to, it's got to, it disrupts the child's life in a very serious way. Um, and so that's where it gets really dicey. This is where there's all the rooms for argument. Um, and they, what they are doing is they are looking at the child's functioning in various areas of development. So, so they generally break those down into six areas of child development. So it, there's, you know, understanding and applying information. How well does the child, you know, learn information? Can they learn it quickly enough uh, or, or not? And how well do they recall that information? How well do they apply that information to real, real world scenarios? Uh, attending and completing tasks, you know, how well does the child focus on a task? Are they able to complete tasks or do they leave everything unfinished? How distracted do they get? You know, are they able to sit and focus in school, for instance? Um, interacting with others is another domain, you know, how well do they get along with other people, including other students, parents, authority figures, things like that. Um, you know, how well are they able to care for themselves? In other words, you know, can they manage their emotions in an age appropriate way? Can they, um, uh, you know, take care of activities of daily living? For instance, you know, are they able to bathe themselves? Are they able to dress themselves uh, without assistance? Now, of course, this all depends on how old the child is. Obviously, they don't expect a toddler to be able to necessarily dress themselves perfectly by this point, but a child who is, you know, 12 years old, they, they would expect to be able to take care of things like that on their own um, by that age. So, um, so they look at that as well. And, you know, various other areas of functioning, they will give a rating as to whether they think you have a mild impairment in interacting with others or a moderate impairment or a very serious, you know, marked impairment. So how do you prove that your child has marked and extreme impairments in their daily functioning? Uh, it's based on medical records, of course. So we're talking records from doctors, hospitals, any other medical facilities, uh, treatment facilities, mental health providers. Um, they're looking at speech therapy records, occupational therapy records, uh, physical therapy, if it's a physical condition, psychotherapy records, opinions or letters written by their, their doctors, their therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists, things like that. So that's the sort of medical evidence that they want to see. There are non-medical records that get used a lot in child SSI cases as well. And the most important are the education records. Uh, the vast majority, not everyone, but the vast majority of our child clients have an IEP, which stands for Individualized Education Program. That specifically means that the child is getting special education in school because of their disability. So they might get various accommodations. Let's say that they have trouble focusing in class. Well, one of their accommodations under the IEP might be that they need to sit in the front of the class or uh, so, so they can like focus on the teacher. Or another accommodation might be the ability to take frequent breaks because they, you know, they can't concentrate for long periods of time, so they need a lot of breaks. So Social Security is going to look, you know, very closely at those school records. Teacher questionnaires, the teachers get to, the child's teachers, and in particular, Social Security wants to hear from their special education teachers, um, you know, how well they're doing in school, uh, are, how are, how are their grades? Are they getting in trouble? Are they getting written up? You know, are they getting detention? Um, you know, how's their behavior? Uh, things like that. They'll look at, you know, statements from parents and other caregivers, you know, who know the child very well. Um, a lot of our clients with developmental disabilities work with the San Diego Regional Center. Uh, and San Diego Regional Center actually helps people uh, children get the IE, IEP process started in school um, and, you know, provide other support services for kids with developmental disabilities in particular. And so we look at those records a lot as well. Now, 
if your child gets approved uh, for benefits, it, they will be reviewed again anywhere from a year after they're granted to maybe five years after they're granted um, to make sure that the child still is disabled and qualifies for benefits because you know the idea is that social security benefits are not meant to be unless you're retired um, are not meant to be permanent you know they're meant to help you get the support you need to or, you know, get some life skills, get some job coaching, whatever the case may be, so that you can improve your functioning and get off Social Security benefits um, and support yourself. So, so they expect that children will improve at some point, whether or not that is actually true or not is debatable. But, you know, in, in, in some cases, you know, our children are able to um, learn enough skills and be able to improve their functioning so that they can be, you know, productive members of society and, and not have to need these benefits anymore. So every case will get reviewed. So what's important for people that are on social security benefits is to continue utilizing all the supports that you have, meaning keep going to the doctor, keep getting treatment, keep, you know, follow all your doctor's orders. If your doctor recommends the medication, and you don't have another good reason for not taking it, you know, do that, or at least don't change or get off your medication without talking to your doctor first. Um, you know, uh, uh, what else was I going to say? Yeah. So just, just basically keep following through on whatever, because if you stop treating once you're on SSI benefits, which happens kind of a lot, um, then a couple of years down the line, Social Security is going to ask you for updates on your medical records. And if they don't get much evidence, they're going to say, oh, you're not going to the doctor anymore because you must be better. So we're going to cut off your benefits now. So if you need to keep treating for your disability, then keep doing that. Don't just think that you can stop once you know you get your SSI benefits. Now, if you get reviewed and they decide to cut off your benefits, you can appeal that decision and you can ask that your child's monthly benefits continue while you're appealing the decision. So um, what parents always need to know though, is that let's say they're like, oh, your child's better. We're gonna cut off, we're gonna cut off his benefits. And you're like, no, 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 no. We still need these. Please, I'm gonna appeal this. Please continue my benefits while I appeal. You keep getting the money while you're going through the appeal process. Now, end of the line comes, you've lost your appeal. You can't really go any further. Um, now, Social Security is going to turn around and ask you to pay that money back that they paid you while you're appealing. So that's something you always need to be aware of. However, that's not, you know, necessarily, um, you know, just because they're going to ask you for the money also doesn't mean that you necessarily have to pay it back because they do recognize that people that qualify for SSI usually can't afford to pay back their debts um, and can't afford to pay back benefits that were paid to them when technically Social Security found that they didn't qualify. So oftentimes you can ask for a waiver. And as long as you can show that the um, you know, you getting the money wasn't your fault, that you had a, you know, sincere belief that your child still qualified for benefits and you weren't trying to commit fraud um, and that you can show that it's, it would be a hardship for you to pay those benefits back. Oftentimes they'll, they'll waive that overpayment. So not only do children get reviewed while they're still children, but they Every single child who is on disability benefits will and, and still is, you know, when they're 17, 18, by the time they turn 18, will get reviewed again once they turn 18. Because the disability standard for adults is different from the disability standard for children. So they are now they have to determine whether your child, whether your now 18 year old uh, qualifies for disability under the adult standard, which is a different evaluation process. It's a five-step process rather than a three-step evaluation process. Um, but the same notification and appeals process happens. Um, uh, you still have the right to ask that your benefits continue uh, while you're appealing. Um, so that is all the same. There is another rule though, in particular, for 18 to 21 year olds who are still either in school under some kind of, you know, special education program, either an IEP or a 504 plan, which is, 
related to disability accommodations, but it's just not an IEP, um, or some kind of voc rehab, qualified voc rehab program. So in those instances, you know, let's say you're 18 years old, you're still in high school, you still have an IEP, but for whatever reason, Social Security decides you technically are not disabled anymore, um, they will still continue to pay you um, and you don't have to pay it back. Like they will still say that you're entitled to the monthly benefits, uh, even though they found you not medically disabled anymore, specifically because you're still in this special education program or this voc rehab program. And the idea behind that is, you know, you, you're sort of almost done gaining all the skills you need to gain and they don't want to cut it cut you off right now and disadvantage you so they'll keep kind of supporting you until you finish that process you either um, graduate from high school and don't have an IEP anymore and aren't gonna have any sort of accommodation in college or um, or if you if you turn 21 then they're just going to cut you off completely no matter what um, so yeah so here are just a couple, you know, stories of people that we've gotten benefits for. We've received benefits for, you know, this little girl, Elton, the name was changed, of course, um, a three-year-old who had severe autism. You know, she wasn't yet toilet trained. She was completely nonverbal, couldn't eat by herself, you know, would just spend a lot of time spinning around and around in circles. She needed a very, very, very rigid structure in order to be able to um, function on her daily life. So we were able to get her uh, benefits. She was one of our um, one of our earlier clients in the children's program. Uh, Eight-year-old boy who had PTSD from being separated from his family. Um, you know, we were able to uh, get them $16,000 in back pay. Okay, so why legal aid? Well, I mean, I think a lot of people know legal aid is is free. Uh, we, we're a nonprofit. We don't charge our clients for, for benefits. Uh, private SSI attorneys work on a contingency basis. And, you know, when um, they take a case and uh, the case gets decided months from now and you get approved months from now, you will get a lump sum payment of back pay. Um, representing, you know, all the months you were eligible from the time you applied until the time they finally found you eligible. So you'll get a lump sum and then the private attorney takes up to 25% of that lump sum or up to $7,500, whichever is lower. We don't do that. Uh, we don't have to take anybody's back pay because we are funded by various entities. So, so we don't have to charge anybody. Um, and you know, I, yeah, uh, so that's the biggest reason, of course, why um, legal aid is, you know, attractive to many people for that reason. And, you know, we assist with, like I said, we assist with all parts of the process. So um, as long, of course, as we think your case has the legal merit to move on, we will help, we will go as far as we, we need to. I mean, theoretically, we would take someone to the U.S. Supreme Court if we really thought the case, you know, had merit to do that. So how do you access our children's SSI services? We have a dedicated intake phone line um, to uh, call and, and ask for help. Uh, the, the 844 number on the screen that you see right now is how you call in. Um, I can also uh, share this information in the chat too uh, or you know email it to uh, Nicole afterward. If you have any issues, you can also, like I said, I'm the senior attorney on the team. You can also email me directly, Dana D at LASSD.org. We also have a website at LASSD.org that has an online help form. So if for whatever reason, you know, you weren't able to get through on the line, um, you can submit an online help form and someone from our intake will uh, call you back once we receive that form. Um, this, of course, is my disclaimer that this is an overview. I'm not providing individual legal advice. Uh, this is our the contact information for my office. We actually have three different offices around the county, um, one in North County in San Marcos. Our main office is in Southeast San Diego on Euclid Ave. And um, the SSI team in particular and where I'm at is this office on San Diego Ave, which is the Midtown um, slash uh, or, or uh, Old Town slash Mission Hills area right off the five. There's a big trolley station there. This 877 number that you see on the screen is our general intake line for any other type of service you might need besides SSI. Uh, like I said, we have the separate line for SSI. Um, 
but this is if you have any other legal issue like housing or immigration or whatever, you can call the 877 number. Um, and that is all I have. So, uh, all right, I guess I'm ready to take mm -hmm. questions now. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. So we got two questions um, and it appears that we have a little bit of time to answer those. So the first one that we got is in terms of unearned income, does wage-based disability count as earned income or unearned? Disability benefits count as unearned income, even though, th you know, technically it's based on, you know, your um, your work history, you know, and taxes that you've paid. Uh, if you're getting disability benefits, it counts as unearned income. Okay, so I'm just going to mark that as answered. And then the other question we received was, what about adult kids who have the mental age of a child? Would the same criteria apply as if as it does to other kids? Uh, no. So if they are an adult, uh, they will be held to the adult standard. Uh, now, that said, we do have a lot of adults with developmental disabilities that might put their mental functioning, you know, as, at a child's age. And uh, that's fine. They're looking at the facts of that. Uh, they are considering that. But uh, technically, the disability standard is still the adult standard. So those were the two questions we had. Um, if anyone wants to type any more questions into the Q&A, we still have a little bit of time to answer them. Yeah, anything at all. And, um, you know, I feel like my presentations, uh, they're an overview, but it's still a lot of information and putting more information on there just kind of tends to confuse people. So that's why I try to keep it more of an overview because like I said, even that has a lot of information. So, but yeah, free, you're free to ask me any sort of further details about the process. So someone just asked a question about the response time for legal aid. They asked, is the response time long when someone asks for help from the legal aid? Um, so that's a good question. Uh, generally speaking, we tell people that, you know, once you inquire with us, someone will usually reach out to you for an intake within the next two weeks. Um, and yeah, every once in a while, for whatever reason, when we've gotten a major influx of, um, you know, referrals or whatever, we might have to tell people it'll be a little bit long. It can be maybe three weeks or something like that um to get a call back but yeah generally speaking uh, uh about two weeks or so okay another question just came in um do you contract with private attorneys to do this work on either a pro bono or other basis so we I mean, at this moment, we don't have any contract attorneys doing SSI work. However, we do absolutely have a pro bono team that tries to, you know, get uh, private attorneys involved. So yes, theoretically, uh, in, in whatever, you know, legal issues, you know, they might be able to help with. Uh, but yes, uh, we do have a pro bono team and a pro bono um, senior attorney that, that tries to get contract attorneys to help out. So we could. And then we just got another question, if you don't mind. Not at all. Staying around. Okay, so this person asked, does a parent need a conservatorship to apply for SSI for an adult child? Uh, technically, no. Um, you do not need a conservatorship. However, it kind of depends on the situation. So, so there's kind of two things that, well, one thing that legal aid is going to look at is whether, you know, for our services is if the child is an adult, you know, that that adult technically is their own, you know, they have their own freedoms now as an adult. So we need to have contact with that adult uh, to make sure they understand what they're hiring us for and make sure they understand, you know, that they consent to doing this. Um, applying for SSI, um, uh, and um, if we if we don't think that that person 
has the mental capacity to kind of understand why legal aid is getting involved, then we have an ethical duty to not retain them unless someone else has conservatorship over them and can make that decision for them. It just kind of depends. I mean, the the bar for legal capacity isn't that high. So as long as they can have some understanding of what's going on, we can usually like, you know, move forward uh, without the conservatorship. As far as like, if you're going to apply for SSI on your own, again, it just kind of depends on how severe um, the adult child's, you know, disability is, uh, mental health disability. So, so technically you do not need to have conservatorship to help um, the person apply. Really anybody that is sort of responsible for them can apply with social security. But the kind of um, caveat is that social security needs cooperation from the actual person who is trying to get the benefits, so the adult child. And so that might look like, you know, Social Security might want to send them to one of their doctors for, for an exam, a mental or a physical exam. And so that person would have to sort of consent to doing that sort of thing. And it, if so, great. Um, if, if not, you know, if, if their cooperation is not going to be there, then maybe, you um, you're going to need the conservatorship to be able to sign SSI paperwork on their behalf because maybe they, they can't sign paperwork. They don't you know, know what's going on. I don't know that even a conservator can force them to go to a social security exam, but, um, but yeah, oftentimes uh, people that end adults um, that end up in the psychiatric hospital, the county psychiatric hospital will be conserved by the county and then the county will fill out the SSI paperwork for them. Um, because they're just too gravely disabled to be able to like do the process themselves. So yeah, um, it just kind of depends on how severe their mental disability is. Okay, and then this one's not a question, but it's a compliment. They said, thank you for a great presentation and they really learned something. Good, I'm so glad. <laughs> so if we don't have any other questions, um, that will be the end of today's webinar. Um, I just want to thank you again for a great presentation and for coming and providing this information to individuals. Um, I also wanted to just remind everyone about that quick survey at the end. Um, if they have a second to fill that out, we would really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, that wraps up today's webinar. Thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it very much. We are so happy to have you. Thank you so much, Dana. Have a good right, one. Thanks. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.